Donna Schwartz here from the Everything Saxophone Podcast. We are at the NAM 2024 show. All of the podcast episodes from this show are being sponsored by Rovner Products, celebrating their 50th anniversary. I'm so excited. I am at the P. Moriat booth, which has seen a ton of action <laughs> during this show. So many... Um, jams and performances that I've captured that we're sharing on social media, but now I have the opportunity to speak with Jeremiah True, affiliated with P. Moriat, but also St. Louis Music as well. He's got an interesting history, he's an awesome person, and I'd like to introduce him to the podcast world. Welcome, Jeremiah. Donna, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it, and first, congrats to Rovner for yes. 50 years. Full disclosure, I'm going to show my age. I've been playing Rovner for 35 of those 50 years. Awesome. So... My very very first, I think it was a Bundy 2 rental, came with a Selmer C Star mouthpiece and a Rovner ligature. So it was in 1987, so congrats, guys. And it was probably a classic dark. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if they, what the model was. It seems like that was ancient history. Uh, so, but anyway, thanks for doing this. Uh, what, where do we want to start here? I'm going to leave it up to you. There's so right. many things to show. All right. Well, as Donna said, my name is Jeremiah True, and... Um, I work for St. Louis Music, and I have the honor and privilege of being the brand manager for P. Marriott North America, distributed by St. Louis Music. And so it is uh, it's amazing to be part of this brand, uh, to be its, its advocate and ambassador here in North America. And so I, I myself play P. Marriott alto, tenor, baritone, flute. So I believe in the brand and uh, use them on a weekly basis. Uh, daily at times. So uh, for NAM, a couple of things I'm really excited about. You know, last year at NAM we introduced our our 20th anniversary alto and tenor, and still have those beautiful instruments. Look at this, hand engraved, actually hand engraved. I watched uh, I watched a lady doing it at the factory. Oh wow! So it was really neat to see that uh, being done, and. The thing that right now is unique about our 20th anniversary is they come in our P. Marriott Touring Case, which is what you see up here on the glowing dais, uh, as it were, with its, its heavenly glow there. And uh, the, the Touring Case comes in alto and tenor and is a little bit unique in the world of cases. It's not actually manufactured by a case company. It's manufactured by the Eminent Luggage Corporation. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so it's made by a, a luggage manufacturer uh, with designs of being light, convenient, protective. So it will fit in an overhead bin in an aircraft, Very the important. tenor, yeah. no problem with that. Um, as, a, as a player and as a working musician, the thing that I like most about it, and you have to forgive me, i got to do a little turnaround here. Can you get that? Because oh. if you can see down here, it has actual padded lumbar support right here so that's like that's a pouch but it's really comfy because it's nice and padded right in your lumbar particularly if you're carrying around the tenor that weight can sometimes be an issue and so and these are luggage grade grommets and luggage grade backpack straps and my favorite part about the the, the touring cases is so many times with hard saxophone cases um, there's very little internal storage yeah, yeah. you're shoving stuff in the bell you're shoving your neck in the bell. You're trying to figure out where you're going to put your swabs, your reeds. You know, you're, if you're a student, where or if you're, hopefully everyone uses a metronome still. But you're, where are you going to put all that stuff? And the thing that's great about the touring case, that external lumbar pouch, you can stow stuff there. But internally, it has a dedicated compartment for the neck as well as uh, tray storage underneath of a saxophone. I saw that yesterday actually, so I watched, um, we were opening opening this up and underneath the horn there's a little, it's like a secret compartment which is great and where you yep. can store the stuff. That's so important. Um, okay, it's made by a luggage company. Is this ABS? What it, What's the material? That's actually polycarbonate. So PC, if you see in any of the marketing materials PC, it's polycarbonate um, which is uh, lighter than ABS, oh, Okay. Uh, equally strong. Uh, a little more expensive to make, yeah, that's for sure. Um, but it's worth it. And a lot of cases, when you get to a case of that size, particularly on tenor, uh, weight can become an issue. And that's kind of when this was designed. We wanted to make sure that 
weight wasn't going to be an issue. You know, I remember some of the old flight cases, they were great protection, but they were very heavy. Yeah. And this case will actually stand on its end. Uh, so those, That's important. so the little legs you see there aren't eye candy. They're not just there to look cool. <laughs> they actually were. So you can see the alto is standing there. Uh, the tenor will indeed stand up as well. So pretty excited about that. Can I ask you with these yep. cases, especially for, oh, actually alto and tenor, big bell horns, like which horns will fit in this, which horns may not? I'm thinking some vintage may not. Um, so, and I can only tell you what I've tried myself and what a couple of my colleagues have tried. Um, so the tenor case will fit all P. Marriott saxophones. Uh, I have put vintage Selmers in it. Um, I have put Yamaha in it. Um, I believe I've put Eastman in it, and those indeed will fit. Uh, I know a Kyleworth is not going to fit, okay, and that just because of the bell size. So full disclosure, I don't want anybody buying one of our cases just to say, because I told you so, but I want you to know a, a Kyleworth is not going to fit in that. Um, as far as like vintage King, Khan, Busher, I have not tried those. Okay, so that's important for everybody those. to know. Yep, absolutely. Don't want to... You know, sell you something, and then you'd be sad right. about it. So do make sure you do your research. And these cases are available at St. Louis Music, but are they also available, you know, through? Well, we we only sell through our dealer partners. Okay. So we we couldn't sell you one directly if we wanted to. Got it. Okay. Um, so we have you know our Main Street dealer partners across the country um, that can sell these, as well as our you know our national level online retail partners also. So we. We make them available to all of our retail partners. So if you've got a dealer in your area, we can absolutely get you a, a case through that dealer. That's fantastic. That's great to know. Awesome. I'm yep. excited. i got to check those out later. Yep, for sure. Cool. For sure. Um, one other thing I, I want to make sure we talk about, and it's, you know, it's any manufacturer, of course, wants to show you their, their best, their brightest, their newest, their blingiest. And, you know, we definitely have that. These 20th anniversaries are beautiful horns they play great they're built on our classic rolled tone hole chassis handmade um, but the two instruments that I'm actually the most excited about are two new entry-level instruments and um, you know for for a lot of saxophonists a soprano or a baritone is often their third or fourth saxophone that they've got to they have to purchase because for doubling it's yep yeah. Yeah, you know, most saxophone players are alto players or tenor players, and you need a soprano or and, and or a baritone as a double. You know, not everyone is, is like me that's a berry player from, from day one. So um, this is our PMSS 185 soprano, and it is made in the same place that our professional sopranos are, it just has a few less bells and whistles. You know, it's complete yellow brass as opposed to maybe a rose brass or something like that. Um, but it still comes with Pisoni pads with metal resonators. It's the same key mechanism. It's the same design as our System 76 Sopranos. Um, but what's awesome about this is online, you know, the internet price for this is under $2,000. Wow. So, you know, I, I've heard a lot of folks say, I just need a cheap Soprano. Well, a lot of times when you say that, you get what you pay for. And what's it sound like? A cheap soprano. Okay, so this one does not do that. Um, I've play tested this one quite a bit, beta tested this one quite a bit, um, tried to play on it every morning that I've been here, and I can't believe how well this plays. It still comes in our P. Marriott Professional Trekking Soprano case. So it's the same case as the Pro Horns. Just a few, you know, less bells and whistles. It comes with one detachable straight neck. I was going to ask you. Okay, so it's a it's a straight neck, um, one detachable. Got one it. One detachable straight neck. So I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. But you know, for under two thousand bucks. Yeah. Here's your soprano. Now let me ask you another question while you're putting that that down. Um, that's the affordable option. Do you have? Uh, one of my friends was looking for was looking for a um, a curved soprano. Mm -hmm. Do you also have curved sopranos? Right over there. Okay, let me just, I'm just going right. to Here we go. over there so you can see this. We're mobile, so we can do this. I see this right over here. So we do indeed make a curved soprano. 
And so that is our System 76 Curve Soprano. And this one just happens to be in dark lacquer with um, abalone pearls. But we also make this in a gold lacquer um, that also has the abalone pearls. So if, if dark lacquer is not your thing, um, then we do have a traditional gold lacquer. I will tell you that my alto and tenor are both dark lacquered instruments. And I play outside a lot, a lot in the summer, a lot of gigs, a lot of rock gigs, music theater gigs. And this dark lacquer is extraordinarily durable. It's, you know, this horn has been played by 100 people at this show, and there's not one fingerprint on it. Wow. It doesn't show any fingerprints. Yeah, I know. I was, I was, just, I'm af I was afraid to touch it because I didn't want to put a fingerprint on it. But <laughs> No, it's a very durable lacquer. Um, and so this is kind of my go-to. But if this is not your vibe, then we have a gold lacquer one as well. That's beautiful. For sure. And Marriott is unique in the sense that um, we make a full saxophone choir, meaning sopranino to bass with two options on the baritone. We, we have uh, baritone saxes with low A's, but we also make a modern key work low B flat berry. Let's, and that's what I play. You know what? Let's head um, on over to the berry. Well, let me, sh oh, let me show them the sopranino first. Yes. Isn't it cute? That is cute. Isn't that adorable? <laughs> And so, once again, if you need an affordable Sopranino, this is an option for you. No, this is not going to cost you $10,000. So, there you go. That is great to know. We're we'll going to take the a little, little walk over here. You may notice this stage, those of you that have been following the Facebook page. <laughs> okay, we're right over here. You were playing, I think, was it this barrier? No, you were playing so that, that barrier. So, yesterday... So this is also new for NAM 2024. And as we spoke about the 185 Soprano, that is a situation where, uh, you know, for most saxophonists, a baritone is going to be their third or their fourth saxophone. And it's a huge investment. You know, it's a huge investment. So we now offer a 185 baritone, the PMB 185. It's made in the same factory as our professional baritones. It's the same family uh, that makes them. The same tube, the same bore, everything. Again, just fewer bells and whistles. All yellow brass construction, yellow brass keywork, Bassoni pads with metal resonators. But the thing I like most about this baritone is MS, or I'm sorry, the internet pricing is $61.99. So you're just over $6,000 for a brand new baritone in an ABS case, wheeled. Oh, wow. You know, so you don't have to schlep it around. Uh, has wheels, plenty of internal storage. And the thing that I really like about the PMB 185 is I would say that it really rings and zings um, because like a lot of vintage baritones, it's post to body construction. And, you know, you know, there's arguments to be had for post to body versus rib, fully ribbed construction, but that post to body is actually creates a lighter instrument. So it's lighter, it's not as heavy. That's important. You know, it, it sings really really well you were performing on that yesterday yes yeah. that's the one i played yesterday yeah th that yeah you're well you know you're a great musician but that sound on that was really really great it just really it really it really popped it really did for sure thank you very much and and the important thing too um especially when it comes to playing barry sax the weight of the instrument a lot of people don't play it because of the weight they also you know like the case being so heavy <laughs> that's another thing having wheels on the case just outright with your, you know, whenever you buy an instrument, you get a case with the instrument, and it's usually good, but sometimes it's not so great. You've got to buy another case in order for it to be, you know, more easily transportable. Just to have wheels on the outset and ABS, that's huge. Right. And so, and it's, you know, it's a traditional kind of rectangular case, which makes it really, really great. So if you're a, a dealer or an educator and you're in the school bid business, you're looking for something... Maybe not so much for a rental pool, but well, for a rental pool is great, but you know, a school bed where you're buying that for a high school band room, you're buying that for a college band room, it's really important to have that ABS. You can stack it, you can stack stuff on top of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, no case is completely foolproof. If you, you, know, you drop it off a 10-foot loading dock, it's gonna get damaged. Um, but it's great if you have a, you know, a seventh grader, sixth grader playing Barry Sax in jazz band, you know, they may not even be able to lift the case. So. Grab the end of it. It's got nice, big wheels. Take it wherever you need to go. I would be taking advantage of the wheels myself. <laughs> Just going to say that. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure. For sure. All right. What is next? Do we go back to our original station? Well, or, oh, no, we've I got wanted to tell you a little here. bit, and this is, this is me personally dorking out 
Uh, I'm a I'm a low B flat berry guy. That's my preference. Um, that was you know I played for years on a low B flat Selmer Mark VI, okay. and uh, I sold that, and now I have a Marriott low B go. flat Mark VI, and so this is our our gold lacquered version. I'm gonna bring this down a little bit. There and go. so it's got a little the bell's definitely a little shorter than a uh, what you might used to be seeing with the low A, and you know that's that's definitely for a specific niche. Uh, a lot of jazz players tend to prefer that, and uh, the low, the whole low B flat experience is a completely different thing, because you think a B flat is the fundamental of the saxophone. Right, right, right. So, just the overtone series, just it 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 voices and slots differently than a low A. Nothing wrong with a low A. It's just when you add that extra half step, you're changing the fundamentals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of that, and so low B flat for me has just got punch character. Uh, but darkness, if you want it. Um, but I, you know, we realize that most modern concert band literature, modern jazz band literature, uh, modern saxophone quartet literature, you got to have a low A. Okay. Um, but we wanted to be able to provide both options to the player. That's good to know. And actually, right next to that, can we talk about sure. this model over here? Sure. So this is our our professional baritone. This is our our PMB 300 DK, uh, one of our best sellers. Uh, this is a beautiful instrument. It's it's, it's it is dark, uh, you know, not just dark lacquer, but that's that's the sound quality, abalone pearls, and you know this is definitely one of our best sellers. And as we talked about the dark lacquer on the curved soprano, that's a really durable lacquer. And on Barry, if you're in the pit orchestra, you're on stage, you know, you've got two and a half feet of brass kind of hanging out here that you've got to always be concerned about. And so that's a durable, durable finish. And what's, I don't want to say it's my favorite thing, but the, the pro baritone cases actually come in a shaped, contoured baritone case uh, with, you know, the, the really durable kind of wing nut latches. Um, and it has an internal storage tray that's large enough to hold an iPad Pro. Oh, great. So a lot of folks have moved to iPads for music. Yeah. You can put it right in there. It's got some ex, you know, other uh, internal storage. It will fit in an overhead bin. Really? Yes. And airlines will say, oh, you can't bring that. Read the FAA rules. You can, yeah. Read the FAA rules. Yeah. I've put it in an overhead bin more than once. Um, so if it fits and it gets in there, you're golden. Yes, just and the whole point with that, just to, to, to track for just one second, um, this is a huge issue for musicians, you know, regardless of the instrument that you're playing. You may have to buy an early ticket to board early. Do it. The thing is, once it's in there, it's not allowed to be moved because someone else is, you know, upset that they can't fit their luggage in there. They got in later. It is in the FAA rules. Yep. And so, you know, those airlines say, does anyone need extra time boarding? Maybe a Barry Sachs player does. I don't know. So... <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But that's, wow, that's huge, though. No pun intended. I'm, I'm pointing to the Barry. I'm saying that's huge. No, but that's huge in the sense that that can fit in the overheads because that, no. that, is, always, that is always an issue. So kind of a narrow profile case. And if you see right here, we've got our iPad storage. That will fit an iPad Pro right there. Heavy-duty latches, and, of course, it rolls. Yeah, the wheels are gold. The wheels are absolutely gold. And it and it stands upright too. Yep. As well. It actually stands upright. So. <laughs> yes. No, super important. Any other things that you want to tell us about or any Sure thing. Yeah. So, a lot of folks may not realize, you know, when they when they think of P Marriott, they think saxophone, and you should. Um, but P Marriott also makes fantastic flutes, fantastic trumpets. Um, but one thing I would want to draw your attention to is our, um, our advanced intermediate clarinet, our PCL 521S. So we'll, we'll hop over here. And actually you're getting a little panning of the booth right now. Thankfully we had a little bit of a quiet moment because it's never quiet over here. <laughs> That's right. It is not <laughs> ever. Um, so this is our PCL 521S. And this is a solid Grenadilla instrument, unstained. It comes like, this is what it looks like, natural. Um, ringless bell and silver keyword. But this is an inter advanced intermediate instrument. 
Um, and what is what is really great about that is is saxophone players. My opinion is you know we all need to be able we need to be proficient at playing other woodwinds, um, simply because if if you if you own a clarinet, you own a flute, you own a bassoon, you're infinitely more marketable. Yeah, for sure. And infinitely more indisposable. But when you're looking down that, you know, the barrel of, okay, I need to buy a soprano, an alto, a tenor, a baritone, a clarinet, a bass clarinet, a flute, or maybe if you're a nut like me, a bassoon, um, then you, you've got you to make some choices. And it may not always be feasible to, uh, to purchase the most expensive top of the line at everything. So this 521S, not only is it great for an advancing clarinetist, you could absolutely get through music school on that clarinet, no problem. It's a really great option for a reed player. If you're like, I need a really good clarinet, maybe you already play Marriott, you want to stay in your brand. And so the, the map, the internet pricing on this is $1,799, so just under eight, 1800 bucks. So it's a clarinet that's going to be under 2000 has a great backpack case uh, made by GL, GL backpack style case. So that's, that's something that I would definitely want to consider if you're thinking Marriott, not just saxophones. But um, my favorite uh, kind of thing I want to draw attention to is the, the 521 app. This is, this is so great to know. Um, I'm so glad you gave us a great overview of a lot of the instruments here. And one of the big themes too, it's quality. It's not just, this is so important. A lot of people think, oh, I'll just get a cheap clarinet. I'll just get a, you know, a cheap soprano or whatever. It, Jeremiah, is, Jeremiah is so right you get what you pay for you know so if you go for the you know the the cheap special that you get second hand third hand or whatever if you're playing an important gig do you really want to trust something like that on a gig that's what you have to think about mm -hmm. you know you have to think about that and you know what i wanted to talk about and this is not necessarily related with pimoriot but your background being in the army and being air force oh, the, i'm sorry the air force it's excuse okay. me we'll forgive you once okay good <laughs> that's awesome so being in the Air Force for 21 years? That's right. And performing in the bands and stuff That's like right. that. Can you talk about that experience? Sure. sure. So it was the it was the best accidental decision I ever made. Uh, I was working in a, a theater and had a job lined up to be a, a woodwind player, union musician, because uh, that's kind of my background is, is more of a reed player. And that that job was, it, as it, it didn't pan out. We'll just leave it at that. And uh, so I went to my 56k dial-up internet modem <laughs> 20 minutes later the screen is loaded I remember those days and I'm <laughs> Google didn't even exist then and uh, so I'm, I'm trying I was doing I think it was doing a, a, a hotmail search or a month I can't remember <laughs> and uh, looking for jobs for musicians and there was an opening at the Air Force Band of Flight in Dayton Ohio right Patterson Ohio and I'm looking healthcare, a place to live uh, benefits, dental, you know, access to all the great services on base, and I was like, sign me up. But it's not easy to get in, though. That's that's the whole thing. Right. Like, oh, I'll just sign up. No, it's no, not. No, you have to, particularly in the Air Force band, you and all of the all of the service bands now. I had to audition, and it was uh, it was an all day audition. I did all legit in the morning, um, you know, classical concert saxophone etudes. Uh, excerpts, and we did that in the morning, broke for lunch, came back, and auditioned on the, the lead tenor chair in the big band. Oh, wow. And okay. uh, I remember it was, I had to sight read Channel One Sweep, the Buddy Rich, and try and play Don Menz's solo. Good luck, right? And so, uh, and so it, it came down to me and one other player, and where it, where I had the advantage is they said okay let's 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 do some sight reading on our doubles i pulled out my clarinet and my flute and that was that was what won me the day yeah was was that doubling capability and so i you know no one you know when i got there no one wanted to play barry sax i said i'll play barry sax and then a few years later i re-auditioned um as a clarinetist and so was a clarinetist for about five years um Played bass clarinet in the concert band, Barry Sachs in the big band, 
and um, started work, started getting my bassoon chops together. And so wound up playing some second and third bassoon and was at Wright Pat for a few years. And then I went to New England. Uh, actually, while I was at Wright Patterson, I deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Qatar. Uh, I think I went to Kuwait. And so I actually deployed as a bandsman. Uh, you know, carried my saxophone and an M9. Um, and so we did troop entertainment, embassy work, uh, uh, you know, performances for the, the local folks in those regions. And so it was a really, it was an incredible experience uh, to do that. Uh, right around an armored personnel carrier with my saxophone. Wow, wow. Um, so I did that. I was at, like I said, New England and then uh, the Band of the Golden West at Travis for five years. And then uh, the last uh, enlistment of my career I did in Japan. So I was with the Air Force Band of the Pacific in Japan, played from one end of Japan to the other, um, a couple of tours in uh, Korea, uh, a trip to Thailand, um, Okinawa, India. Oh, oh my gosh, you've been all uh, over. Played. played saxophone quartet gigs in India. Wow. Um, and so that, but the ability to be, to make yourself indispensable as a musician is, is, is key. Actually, and I'm going to argue, no, I'm not going to argue, I'm going to say this. I think that your ability to double changed your whole life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the first gig that I got, so when I, I auditioned for my St. Louis music job as I was retiring. Did I say auditioned? Yeah. Whoops, sorry. Interviewed okay. uh, for my St. Louis music job. And, you know, got back, built the house, getting spun up in this job. And the very first gig that I got was the national playing gig was a national tour of Mean Girls. Oh. Okay. And so I got to do that for a, a time. Uh, when it was, you know, when it was in town, and the writer called for Barry sax, tenor sax, clarinet, bass clarinet, flute. Wow. And I owned them, could play them, and I got the gig. Yeah. And, you know, I did, um, and closer to home for me with the, the Lexington Theater Company in Lexington, Kentucky. I live in Kentucky. I did all three of their productions this last year simply because I owned a bassoon. I'm by no means the best bassoonist. There are a lot better bassoon players in the region. But I also play Barry Sax, bass clarinet, bassoon. And so that, you know, being able to diversify and do that and then go play a Jeff Ruby's gig the next weekend, I'm not the best at any one of those things. I'm not the best Barry player. I'm not the best center player. Certainly not the best bassoonist. Um, but to, to have a modicum of experience in those instruments um, will we'll put a lot of players to the front of the line yeah. over someone who may be like the most smoke and lead alto player you've ever heard. They sound like Marshall Royal or Phil Woods screaming. But it, when it comes time to get out their clarinet or their flute, they sound like a sixth grader. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with sounding like a sixth grader when you're in the sixth grade. Right, right, exactly. Let me ask you something. Playing all of those instruments, your practice regimen, what do you do? How do you, you know, how do you work this out? Okay. So, um, when I was in the Air Force Band, you know, I was, I was paid to play. And, you know, practice time, for me, I built that in early in my day from 6 to 9 every morning. That was my practice time. And, you know, with, with St. Louis music, you know, I still play as a, as a means of beta testing instruments, play testing instruments, quality control, but I'm not paid to be a player. Right, right. That's not my job. My job is to, is to brand manage. So in order to keep my face together and my hands together, you know, I get up early, early in the morning and I usually practice between six and eight, okay. sometimes five to eight. Oh, wow. Um, because I know that I have to do that because practice is such an incremental thing. You know, it's I say it's you're better to do a lot of a little than a little of a lot. Inch inch wide, mile deep. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I know that if I'm playing my flute 30 or 40 minutes every morning, that's better than playing it once every six weeks for four hours. 
Got it. Okay, so then let's talk about a typical day. Do you start off on the flute? A uh, typical day, typically when I try to start off on flute, it doesn't go well. Okay. Uh, just because for some folks it does. I like to have something that gets the blood flowing to my face before I pick up that flute. Got it. Okay. Um, so I, I tend to start, you know, I, I practice, I tend to start on what's my next gig? You know, what, what's coming up for me next? And, you know, next for me is, a, is a, I'm in a chamber ensemble. And so it's turn of the century, Kurt Vile, Ricky Tick kind of stuff. Uh, wow. Um, so I, I'll tend to start on um, saxophone or clarinet first. Okay. Um, ideal world, I start on clarinet. Uh, I think it's the most intense as far as the embouchure. It's the most intense as far as the fingering. It's the most intense as, as just control. And so if I can get in my, my embouchure work, my articulation work, my finger exercises, my dexterity, just hit it really hard for 30 or 40 minutes, nonstop, not messing around on my phone, taking 100 breaks, really get that. Then after that, saxophone's a piece of cake. Yeah. Then saxophone is all all style work. Yeah, I don't you know I don't really do a ton of saxophone technique practice anymore. It's mostly styles, tunes. You know, do I have to sound like Lenny Pickett on this gig? Okay. Then the next gig. Okay. Now I got to sound like Jerry Mulligan on this gig. Um, I'm definitely not an innovator. I am an emulator. Okay. That's good. That's good and to that's, know. And that's that's kind of how I've made my career, is being whatever the gig needs at the time. Um, and then I'll typically move on to flute after that, because by that time I've got the blood flowing to my face. And on flute, I practice on number one tone. The technique will follow if you're practicing clarinet. It's tone. If you don't have a good flute tone, it, the rest doesn't matter. Yeah. Second is flexibility. And if you have a good tone and you have lip flexibility, then automatically intonation is going to follow. So I practice drones every day. I, have a, I use a, a, a book called the Intonation Repair Tool, which is a series of drones, practice drones for music, just to figure out where every note on every woodwind sits within the chord structure um, wow. for, for pitch. So. I tend to practice more technique and flexibility and styles than I do improvisation. But I do practice improvisation. And uh, so I also try and at least a couple, three times a month work a new, and I, it sounds very basic, but a 2-5-1 lick through all 12 keys. And that just keeps my harmonic brain thinking right. when maybe I'm playing you know, in a, a rock and roll cover band or doing music theater where... I'm not thinking two five ones. I'm not thinking the bridge to Cherokee. But if I'm working one through all twelve keys a few times a month, that keeps my brain working. Yeah, for sure. Wow, that's that's a, a an intense schedule. I think that's you. There's so many points to this too. You know, not being distracted by the phone, right? Having clear goals, clear goals to achieve for not just the whole session, but for each instrument. And you know what I wanted, um, just for a couple more minutes, if you don't mind, when you're digging into the styles. For saxophone, talk about like, um, let's say Lenny Pickett. All right, so what are you going to do? You're going to listen to him, obviously, and talk a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. And I, you know, I realize there ultimately is a, a finite amount of time in the day, and you know, I can only, for me personally, develop that skill set out on the different instruments so far. And so I've kind of picked my lanes on the saxophone. And I, I tend to stay in those lanes. So for, you know, for tenor, you were talking about Lenny Pickett. Most of the tenor work I do is commercial, rock and roll. You know, I play at Jeff Ruby's from time to time with a, a roots band, basically. And so, you know, I'm thinking in my head, okay, I'm going into, it's not a 251 bebop lick based thinking. It's a more of a lateral, minor pentatonic, up a whole step, down a whole step sometimes to get a little bit of out sound to grab people's attention. Practice my altissimo a lot on tenor. A lot of altissimo exercises on tenor. 
I don't think anything like that when I play baritone. When I play baritone, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, standards. I listen to Jerry Mulligan every day. There's not a day that goes by I don't listen to Jerry Mulligan. Um, so I, I have a different brain for that on Barry. Alto, you know, my favorite alto players in the world, he's actually sitting right over there at that booth, Mike Smith. And Mike Smith over at, uh, at Babbitt Mouthpieces. And if I want to sound like, if I have an alto saxophone sound, I want it to sound like that. So I think big, you know, centered pitch, right in the belly of the sound, belly of the pitch. And that's how I think for alto is like, I'm, a, I'm a playing lead, it's the styles, you know, memorize Phil Wood solo on all the, on uh, just the way you are. Yeah. You know, those kinds of things is, is how I think on alto. And that's more of like style, sight reading, articulation, pitch. I don't think of myself as a great improviser on alto. Um, and again, that's just how my brain works. Uh, for soprano, I think as dark as possible, and I want it to sound like an English horn. Right, right, right. Yeah. You don't have to try to sound bright on soprano sax. The tessitura takes care of that itself. Exactly. And so soprano sax, you know, I, I love playing soprano and saxophone quartet. I like to practice oboe transcriptions, English horn stuff. Um, and that's just kind of how I think on that. And, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's been a lifetime. But this is invaluable advice for people that not only double, but also even in your own practicing routines as well, you're getting in the mind of someone, he's a really good player, you're getting in the mind of what he's doing, and the biggest thing is that he's not distracted, you know, and he's got a plan for his practicing. And what I love that you also said too, we all have roles when it comes to music. You know, the styles that we like, um, the styles that we play, but also in terms of, you know, everybody can improvise for sure, but also recognizing your strengths. Because for some of us, we're, we're better at emulating. Um, for some of us, we're better at soloing and all that kind of thing. And many people are great when it comes to reading and playing legit and all that type of thing. Recognize your strength. I think that's the most important thing. For sure. And, you know, not, and there are, you know, we have them on the Marriott roster, what I would call true artists. You know, it's like, this person is an alto saxophone player. And they're an artist on it. Awesome. Same thing for tenor, same thing for baritone, same thing for soprano. Um, and just my career, my route, my path took me down the road of being dropped into a concert band, a marching band, a jazz band, a saxophone quartet, a clarinet choir, you know, the opera pit for uh, Candide or Mean Girls, or we're at Jeff Ruby's playing squealy high notes, or it's White Christmas and now I'm playing bassoon. And so it was, that was kind of the, the path that developed and evolved and I chose. And you know, when I think of a great saxophonist who are like any style, you know, the first person that pops in my mind is Dan Higgins. Um, and if you've ever watched a Disney movie or anything that John Williams wrote, I guarantee you, you've heard Dan Higgins. Um, but he's such a chameleon. He does have his own voice. If you listen to his jazz album is one of my favorites. Um, but if you need legit and John Williams has written something for you, it's it's Dan Higgins. You need somebody to play screaming rock and roll tenor in the middle of a movie, it's probably Dan Higgins. You need someone to play the Yaz flute, it's probably Dan. Um, just a chameleon uh, of all sorts. So That's really cool. And and to bring this home, first of all, thank you so much for your time. He's so busy here, so I'm really grateful that you gave us all this time. But at the P. Moriat booth, so again, just doing like a kind of like a quick pan and stuff. You have so many instruments available, and if you check out our Facebook page for the podcast, but also we're gonna maybe attach some stuff to this interview as well. We had that whole group that was performing right over here on the stage, and the trumpet player, Josh Aguilar, really good, really good, very yep. tasteful player. One of our Marriott trumpet artists. Yeah, yeah, yep. you've got all the instruments here, so if. There are some of us, I play trumpet also, so some of us double on trumpet and saxophone, so you have some opportunities here as well. Listen, Jeremiah, I wanted to thank you so much, and I'm so grateful you had the opportunity to be with us on the podcast. All right, thank you, Donna, and good luck, everybody. Awesome. Thank you for stopping by.